I'd like to welcome to the stage my sisters from another mother. <laughs> We're a bunch of mixed women and we just uh, feel it's necessary to share songs and stories. So we'd like to start off in a good way with, after our, following our prayer with um, a song of healing. And this is to open ourselves up to that healing energy, not only for ourselves, but for those around us, our family, our friends, and for our beautiful Mother Earth. So this is the healing song. Now tonight, uh, I'm going to actually pass it off to uh, Reverend Bill Phipps, Reverend Dr. Bill Phipps. Ooh, that sounds important. Uh, he will be moderating this evening and introducing everyone. But just to introduce him, uh, he's a retired minister from the United Church of Canada. He was minister of Scar Scarborough United Church in Calgary in 1993 to 2007, and with time out to be moderator for the United Church from 1997 until the year 2000. He is co chair of the Faith of Common and Good Interfaith Network and is a member of the Peace Consortium at the University of Calgary. He is an author of A Cause for Hope. Throughout his working life, Bill has been an advocate for social justice and particularly in recent years, climate justice and care for the earth. As moderator, Bill issued the United Church Apology to Survivors of his Indian Residential Schools in 1998. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Bill Phipps. Well, we are in for a very special evening, as you can already understand from the marvelous opening we have had. It's important to gather ourselves, to center ourselves, and to put ourselves within the care and nurture of our mother, the earth. And the prayers and the songs do that for us. So thank you for that opening. And we're also going to hear from some very uh, impressive people who uh, put their, their values, their lives, their passion on the line for uh, climate justice, for earth justice, for the people in their communities, and not only in their own communities, but far beyond. Because the issue of fracking and the related issues around that uh, are coming to affect people all over the world, actually. Uh, not only in our own regions in Canada, but all over the world. And it's extremely important because the public doesn't know very much about this stuff. It's extremely important that we have public gatherings where people can come freely to listen, to ask questions, and to seek understanding about what is going on uh, with fracking and related issues in our country. So I'm very happy to welcome the people who are on the panel here tonight. Uh, they have different uh, time frames, uh, which, is, uh, which is good. Um, and I'm going to have to, uh, what I will do is give them about a two minute warning. And we, we've all agreed to that. So uh, I don't have a big hook here that I can, I can get everybody, but uh, see, I've already cut myself off. That's what I do. I just, I just unplug this thing. Uh, we will try to be uh, flexible about that, but we also want to have time for, uh, for questions and for conversation after the presentation. So uh, we'll move right along now. Uh, but I, uh, just in closing my, my introductory comments, I really want to thank everyone for the preparation you've done, for the work that you're doing in your own communities, and for taking the time to be here 
uh, to educate and to engage in conversation. Great deal of admiration for each one of you. <clears throat> now the first person up is uh, Lori Bravelock, who is from the Kenai Blood Reserve. Uh, Lori is an enrolled tribal member of both the Blood Tribe here in Alberta and the Blackfeet Tribe in Montana, uh, both of which, of course, are part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. She is an entrepreneur, activist, and organizer within the Idle No More movement. Let's hear it for Idle No More. She is also a current board member with the Old Man Watershed Council. And prior to Idle No More, she began raising awareness of her concerns about the risks involved with fracking when it was announced in 2010 that this type of extraction would be utilized on the Blood Reserve, where she resides. Raised traditionally, she learned the importance of the relationship the Blackfeet people have with their lands, water, plants, animals, and their sacred place within this culture. In the spirit of First Nations, as stewards of the lands, waters, and skies, she urges everyone to take an active role in the protection of all that we hold dear for all of our future generations. Be wise and persevere. So it's my pleasure to welcome Lori here and hear how you can educate all of us. Okay, everyone, I'm gonna really try to get through this quickly. <laughs> and I'll, I'll keep an eye out for my, my time here, my... 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, um, basically, when we learned, we, we heard uh, for the fracking, what, we didn't know it was actually a fracking announcement when we had heard. We uh, got this notice here and uh, it, it was uh, very hard to come by. Uh, but it says, uh, Blood Tribe Community Meeting, uh, Chief and Council will be in attendance to hear comment, concerns and questions from community members. This was on October 20th, was the first meeting that we attended because I live uh, on the Blood Reserve. Uh, the second uh, date they had was October 22nd, and that was in Lethbridge, which is an hour away, uh, an hour or so away from where we live. So I, we attended the first meeting. Uh, and there were no, uh, there was a microphone set up, uh, but there were no questions or uh, any concerns that were expressed that day during the community meeting. Uh, when the meeting wrapped up, we actually found out that the microphone that they had set up was not even plugged in. Uh, so on the front of the cover, this was the, the first thing that I, that I, I was not too happy with. Uh, me and my mom, my grandmother, uh, my family, we were all in attendance of this meeting. And the first thing that I, that I noticed about it was that they have the picture of our Sundance. For one, I didn't, I, I've always been told that you're not allowed to photograph our Sundance, but this was from a distance and this was on our oil and gas uh, information booklet, it's on our, our, our Sundance. So I was telling my mom, I'd be a lot happier if one of these was actually on the cover because this is really what we're talking about. This is what it should be on the cover. This is what this whole thing is about. But uh, they were on the inside here. So one of the things that I like to highlight are setback distances. And if uh, you haven't been aware of what these setback distances are in regards to fracking here in Alberta, I don't know if this is across Canada, but uh, the residential setback distance from uh, a person's house on the reserve is 150 meters. And uh, that was the, the standard from ERCB. And now, uh, now it's the Alberta Energy Regulator, so it's no longer the ERCB. So I don't know if those have changed. Uh, the, and one of the things that disturbed me the most about this is that the water setback distance is 50 meters. So they can be 150 meters from your home, but they can be even closer to a river or a lake or, or a reservoir, it doesn't matter what it is. They can be 50 meters from that and frack within that distance. Uh, within regards to our water, they, they try to quell our concerns by saying none of the water that is going to be used in the fracking process is going to come from the reserve and none of the water that is going to be the, the, the frack water will also not be dispersed on the reserve. That'll be taken 27 kilometers away, but they would not tell us where. 
Uh, during the meeting, they uh, gave a presentation from Kainai Resources Incorporated, and they're basically the company that would handle all of the uh, lease agreements, the information, the hiring, uh, whatever in regards to that would be Kainai Resources Incorporated. When they gave their presentation, they gave these maps out, which were a lot smaller, and I've had them blown up. These are actually the drilling zones, and if you look, uh, I don't know why they wouldn't give us just one whole map. We ended up coming up with a map later on about maybe a month later, and this was supposed to be a big secret. I don't, everybody that had given it to us was saying, do not tell, don't, don't say that I gave this to you. Uh, don't say that you talked to me, um, but I support what you're doing, but just don't say I said because I could lose my job. And so we ended up coming up with this map here, and these are the, this is the full drilling zone, and they're telling us that this is half of the reserve, but to me, just by looking at it, it doesn't look like half of the reserve. Um, in this picture here, you can actually see this is the northern portion of the reserve, and we have over 130 producing oil wells already. And uh, we don't know whether they have been fracked. We've had one council member that basically came forward uh, in one of the newsletters and said, well, we've already been doing fracking. Why are you guys raising concerns about this now? You didn't even know that fracking was going on here to begin with, so we wouldn't know. Um, this community meeting that we attended was the first one I've ever heard of in my life. Uh, living on the reserve. I'd never heard of a community meeting in regards to that. So when we started having the open houses, we had an open house from uh, Murphy. Uh, Murphy Oil is actually, they're doing the, the lower portion here. And Bowood Energy, they're, not, they're no longer called Bowood Energy. They're called LGX Oil and Gas. So when they started uh, fracking, you know, they were telling us that they're only looking for oil, but now, they're, now they've changed their name, and now they're basically saying that they're doing oil and gas. But when we uh, did the open house with them, they said, no, this is oil, oil, and oil alone. It, you guys are not um, raising concerns about gas because we're not here for gas, like that was supposed to make us feel better. But when we had the open houses, then I said, well, where's the open house for all of these wells? If we've been doing this and we obviously have leasing agreements and we also have royalties and whatnot, where's the open house for the company that has been doing this, this drilling here? Um, we've never gotten answers from them. I believe they were called Bonavista Petroleum, but it seems odd that these companies keep changing their names. And uh, so I don't know what they'd actually, if they're actually still Bonavista Petroleum. This lower portion is uh, closer uh, to my where I live. Uh, we are the largest reserve in Canada, um, largest First Nation reserve in Canada. And so this portion here is the portion that concerns me because this is the heaviest populated portion of the reserve. Uh, this is where the majority of, uh, if you look on, uh, we have some maps that were used for contact information and who lived in these areas, and the, the majority of the homes are in these areas. Uh, the northern portion of the reserve is, 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 you know, you'll see a house here and there, but they're not closely, like there are no uh, major communities in the northern portion of the reserve, where in the southern portion we have at least three or four um, major, you know, communities where they're largely grouped together. So that that was another concern that I had um, been been raising there. And uh, when this all happened, uh, it brought forward um, this question that I had. We were supposed to have a referendum vote. We had a referendum vote for Kainai government agreement. And we were also supposed to have a vote uh, in regards to giving the tribe uh, wants to obtain control over its oil and gas resources. And so this whole issue of FANAGMA, the First Nations Oil and Gas Money Management Act, came out. And we never got an official reason. Uh, there was an article that was written uh, where they basically said that uh, the government was telling them to do uh, something and they didn't want to do that, so they had dropped it. So this whole issue just went away. We never had a referendum vote. Uh, I don't know what the status is right now, but when you go to the website, you're still seeing the whole phenomena. Um, issue is still there, but it's not something that uh, has been addressed since they've, uh, they just basically said that the vote was going to be held off indefinitely. 
So we basically, and there, there was more information, because we asked that, like, why wasn't there a referendum vote when this decision was made? If something goes wrong, you know, we're the ones that are living near these wells. Uh, what happens, you know, what are the, you know, how are we going to be affected by this when we didn't actually give the consent to have this on our lands? This was just an announcement that was made. We went and we found out in it. So from, from the day that we uh, attended this meeting, was on October 20th, uh, 2010, uh, the first agreement the first leasing agreement was signed five days later on Monday, October 25th, 2010. So from the time I learned about it as a community member residing on the reserve, on October 20th, I had two days to even, you know, just the three days because that was on a Wednesday. They had the, the second meeting for community members in Lethbridge on Friday and the first agreement was signed on Monday. So there really was no chance that we had to, you know, protest it, to stop it. It was, it was basically a done deal. So in regards to the referendum, then we come across this document that is from Oil and Gas Canada, and it was something that they had released to us at one of the open houses. Uh, this is my only copy, though, but uh, it states in here that uh, it talks about land designations, and it talks about that a designation is conducted by a referendum of the First Nation and to become official must be accepted by the governor and council through an order in council. So when this came up and we said, well, even Oil and Gas Canada is saying that we should have had a referendum vote. They told us, somebody said the way that they're getting around that is that when you guys, uh, back in 1952, your population was something around 3,000, you guys did a referendum vote back then and that is what they applies today. So those, uh, whoever had done that referendum vote gave up that control back in 1952. And so there really was no more discussion about having a referendum vote on the, the drilling itself. So uh, then we go to the open houses and we were not treated very well, I will say. Um, you know, we uh, gave them a lot of trouble. We gave them a lot of questions. I, I got one of the guys from Murphy because they were telling us there had never been any problems. We've never had any concerns. And I said, really, really, I mean, tell me the truth. And so he said, okay, yes, there has been a problem here in Alberta with fracking. And I said, oh, it's, somebody finally said it. Somebody finally said it. I, I, I couldn't believe it. And then he said, oh, but that was 20 years ago. <laughs> and I was saying, okay, well, then what's going to happen 20 years from now? Where do you guys stand as far as responsibility if something happens with one of your wells today? If something happens with one of the wells now and, and you know, or, you know, from 20 years from now, if the casing fails, who's responsible then? And they basically said, this is, you know, why we have all the regulations, and it's always about the regulations. But I, I found an interesting thing just reviewing this last night, and, I, and it's been a while because I've been, uh, like I've been saying, I've been uh, working within the Idle No More movement. We've had all this legislation we've had slammed at us, and we've been trying to learn. But uh, one of the things that they uh, mentioned in here uh, and it wasn't until after all this legislation started coming through, is that the environmental protections that are actually listed here, they actually talk about the Fisheries Act. And of course, that was affected by the Bill C-45. The other protection here that they talk about for environmental is the Navigable Waters Protection Act. And again, that has also been, so now I look at this and I think, well, where are we today? This was in 2010. We've had all of this legislation that is now law, so where do we stand on our, our environmental protection today? And they told us at this time that these things would never be changed, right? Because the government would never change these. We're protected, right? Because these are the regulations, but they have changed. So where do we stand with that environmental protection today? Okay. So in closing, I will just say very quickly that where we are today is, I will refer back to this map here. And I will ask you to look at the Bowood portion because this was concerning to us when we saw this. Uh, I looked at the website recently when they changed their name to LGX Oil. And if you can see in the orange portion up here, 
uh, we tried to lay it on, on the side of this one to show that this orange portion right here, that little blob, is actually this portion here. So I was saying, what is all this underneath? That was never there before. The company is new. What is all of this? So we overlaid it. And this orange portion down here, we thought was the Murphy area, they're actually going to be fracking on the other side of the reservoir on off reserve. So my question is, what's the point of stopping it on a reserve when it's going to be all around our reserve? If we don't look towards a moratorium within southern Alberta or within Alberta as a whole, we are not really gaining anything. So that's where I stand. Moratorium in Alberta. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Brian Seaman is a human rights and civil liberties advocate, writer, and public speaker. From November 2004 to November 2013, he was the research associate at the Alberta Civil Liberties Research Center. In addition to writing for them, Brian's articles and commentaries have appeared in over 100 print and online media sources in Canada, South America, Europe, uh, including Law Now, uh, Parole Family Rights Journal, Migration Letters, the Calgary Herald, and so forth. He's also participated in discussions for broadcast for CTV, Alberta Prime Time, APTN, and the Foundation for Democratic Advancement. Brian has written several articles and made several presentations and appearances in connection with the Idle No More movement, most frequently in connection with the Canada-China Foreign Investment and Promotion Agreement. He's been a vocal critic of that agreement because it favors Chinese investment in Canada's energy and natural resources sectors at the expense of native rights, sound environmental regulations, and Canadian jobs. Brian? Okay, well, thank, thanks very much, Bill, for that, uh, that introduction. And uh, first of all, I want to say how proud and privileged I feel to be sharing the stage with uh, two uh, women, two Native women, who are representative of their respective nations, the uh, Blackfoot and uh, the Mi'kmaq peoples, and indeed have put themselves on the line uh, to defend the land, uh, to defend all of our rights, because when they stand for the land, they stand for all persons, indigenous and non-indigenous peoples who live in this land. I'd like to explain about how I came to know Suzanne Paddles, and I'll be keeping my comments relatively brief because uh, I want you to share, I want her to share with you all her incredible story of personal courage. She does exemplify warriorship, kind, compassionate, defiant, and strong. So I uh, met, so to speak, uh, Suzanne Paddles along with a lot of other people these days uh, through, through Facebook. Um, several months ago, I was keeping tabs on uh, what was taking place back east in Elsa Patog, uh, New Brunswick, which is a Mi'kmaq reservation uh, about uh, 50 minutes outside of Moncton. I am from the east coast originally, so it was of great, uh, great interest to me to see this remarkable and unique alliance between the first peoples of the region, the uh, Mi'kmaq, their Maliseet allies, Acadians, and English-speaking people from throughout the region gathered together in a defense of the land at a place, near a place called El Sipatog. They had set up a sacred fire camp. I uh, was following what had taken place with Suzanne. Uh, she was one of the first people to be arrested and charged by the RCMP. Although um, at least half the people back there defending the land are Acadians and English-speaking New Brunswickers, the uh, number of charges fell disproportionately heavy on the First Nations peoples. It was clear to me that they were targeted and that they, uh, they were perceived as being the low-hanging fruit. So I kept uh, tabs with uh, what was taking place with Suzanne and was going to fly her out here to uh, speak to uh, First Nations and their allies uh, out here, and then a little thing called the Calgary Flood happened. So um, 
I changed my plans and flew back east and spent two nights uh, at the Sacred Fire Camp where I spent a lot of time with Suzanne, getting, getting to know her. And uh, one of the things I learned from Suzanne was that uh, the Mi'kmaq have seven words to describe laughter. And uh, she kept me laughing until the wee hours of the night sitting around the Sacred Fire Camp. I think we were told three or four times by camp security to keep the laughter down. But uh, it's certainly the highlight of my summer is meeting Suzanne Patlos and, uh, and sharing, spending time with her. So I've kept in touch with the people back east. Uh, I've done a lot of pro bono work for them, uh, answering questions, assisting them uh, in preparing uh, defenses. Um, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible here, and I'm going to uh, focus on, first of all, uh, several breaches of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police's own cultural protocols for dealing with Indigenous peoples. Uh, I've read this document, and among other things, the RCMP recognize, at least on paper, if not in practice, but on paper, they recognize the unique relationship that Indigenous peoples have to the land. Um, the land is the church, if you will, of the Indigenous peoples, and it is very sacred. Therefore, having said that, Suzanne Patlas and indeed any, any Indigenous person is free to pray anywhere on the land where he or she chooses to do so. Uh, which brings me to the uh, serious violation of, of uh, Suzanne Patlas' uh, not only uh, civil liberty, the right to practice uh, religion in accordance with Section 2 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but indeed the right to practice it as an Indigenous person of this land and indeed the RCMP's own cultural protocols recognize that. When Suzanne Patlas was uh, first arrested back in, uh, in mid-June of last year, she was praying uh, along the roadside, and there's an image, an iconic image that I will never forget. It shows Suzanne crunched in, in prayer and surrounded by at least 20, perhaps 30 RCMP officers in full uh, full of SWAT gear with a vest on, and it was clearly an attempt to intimidate and to bully and to coerce. I'll let Suzanne tell you more about, uh, about that experience when she speaks. For those of you who don't know uh, much about uh, the province of New Brunswick, um, if you think that Alberta is dominated by, by an industry and that we have a compliant media that is easily coerced or doesn't report because they're afraid of standing out and criticizing an industry, you should live in New Brunswick for a while. Uh, there's a powerful family called the Irvings, which are multi-billionaires and they essentially own New Brunswick. Over 55,000 New Brunswickers are directly employed by an Irving company or indeed a subsidiary of the Irving company. They own all the media in New Brunswick, both French-speaking and, uh, and English-speaking, with the exception of the public broadcaster, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, or its French, uh, French adjunct, the uh, Radio-Canada. So, consequently, the media has been very uh, shy about reporting on what's been taking place back at Elsa Patug, and what coverage there has been has been to put it mildly, biased. I mean, even the public broadcaster, the CBC, frames what's been taking place back there as a contest between the environment and the economy. So it's that old meme which we're being sold that you can't have alternative sources of energy, you can't have sound regulations for the environment that protects the land and the water for future generations, or you're gonna have a bad economy. Those of us who look abroad and do something called reading. Huh. We know that there are countries in the world where they have robust economies. Germany, um, unless I'm mistaken, Germany is not an economic backwater. Indeed, in many years, its economy has outperformed Canada's. And look at the challenge that Germany has had to deal with in the, its post-war history. Over 30% of Germany's energy comes from renewables, the sun, water. They have solar farms in Germany the size of small cities the size of Lethbridge, and Germany has a robust economy. <clears throat> the, um, the, uh, some of the tactics that uh, I've seen on display uh, back east by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, um, and I can only call them tactics, are, there's two main ones that come to mind. Um, 
I've termed one of them catch and release. The second I've termed a good cop, bad cop. Catch and release refers to the fact that uh, during the first, uh, the first uh, camp, the Sacred Fire camp, there were 33, 34 persons who were, who were uh, arrested and charged uh, with minor offenses, uh, the most common one being um, public, public mischief for exercising their right to demonstrate and peacefully assemble, which is a charter right. And um, of all these charges, of all these people's charges, and before I go further, I must stress again that the vast majority of these people were uh, the Mi'kmaq people, even though, as I said, at least half the people who were there uh, demonstrating peacefully were, uh, were, uh, were non-natives. Uh, non they were Acadians and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Maritimers from all walks of life. You know, I met doctors, lawyers back there, um, teachers, nurses, and truck drivers and, and, and waitresses. I mean, it, it, it's supported by all the people. But uh, of all those people who were charged, uh, most of them eventually had the charges uh, dropped. The second time they saw this mass arrest occur was uh, um, during the second uh, protest camp, which was set up in the uh, late summer, early fall. And, um, and then, of course, uh, there was a day that uh, will live forever in, in my memory, and, and certainly Suzanne's October 17th, when the RCMP raided a peaceful camp. And again, dozens of people were arrested over this period of time, and, uh, and charges were, if charges were laid, they were eventually dropped. But this time around, this is where I came up with the term catch and release, because this time around, the vast majority of people who were arrested were simply held in detention, in jail, for hours, in some cases overnight, and then let go. There was a, an independent journalist from, uh, from Halifax who this happened to three times, and on the third occasion, he was held overnight in jail in Moncton and let go the following morning and had to make his way back to Elsa Patog, which was, you know, an hour away by, by car. So why, are people being, uh, so why are people being picked up and, uh, and held in detention and then released without charge? It's clear to me that this is a tactic to intimidate and coerce people. The other uh, tactic that I saw was what I call good cop, bad cop. And um, I saw examples of this in the following way, and Suzanne can maybe elaborate on this some more when she talks. The RCP are supposed to respect the cultural and religious traditions of the First Nations peoples. So they would do things like, uh, they'd have a, they'd say, we just want to talk. And so, Suzanne on one occasion and, and some other Native people, most of them women, met with the RCMP and tobacco was, uh, was given to the Native peoples, which of course is a sacred, uh, a sacred uh, substance in the, uh, in the First Nations traditions and they'd reach an agreement. And then the next day some people would be arrested or on one memorable occasion the RCMP raided the camp uh, on October the 17th after they had a, a supposedly peaceful uh, ceremony a uh, day or two before. So I call this good cop, bad cop, because to me, this is a clear attempt to use psychological uh, manipulation, psychological warfare, if you will. To me, it is uh, rather analogous to an abusive relationship where you have one partner who is kind and loving one day and then goes ballistic and beats. Usually it's the woman who's on the receiving end the next day, and then it's, oh, honey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let's, let's make up and uh, a gift is exchanged or a trip is given to her and, and, uh, and then they resume their pattern of abuse. What it is, it's a way to keep people off center, scared, and it's a way to manipulate them. Um, I'll just uh, conclude uh, my, uh, my comments here by saying that uh, not only has the RCMP been engaged in, uh, in what I consider to be harassment and intimidation of the people, but the uh, company itself, uh, Southwest Nova, uh, Southwestern Resources rather, goes by the uh, acronym SWN. It's a Texas-based uh, oil and gas company, uh, which has done fracking throughout the uh, U.S., and, and now they want to move up here onto our territory and, uh, and use the fresh water of the land to get at shale gas. And their track record down the United States is, to say the least, uh, pretty poor. Um, so SWN um, 
has uh, launched what's called a strategic lawsuit against public participation. SLAP is the acronym, S-L-A-P-P. And they have uh, sued several individuals, half of them native, half of them non-native. Uh, Suzanne Patlas is one of the people who was sued. And they're essentially claiming loss of profits in the amount of $60,000 in damages uh, per person for every day that uh, they were not able to successfully proceed with uh, testing for, uh, for oil and gas. Um, they, uh, they call it thumping. They use these thumper trucks. It's seismic testing. And um, a lot of the uh, basis for their suit uh, was as ridiculous as this may seem to you. It certainly seems ridiculous to me. was comments uh, lifted from people's Facebook uh, pages. Um, it's a ridiculous lawsuit. Uh, a legal team has been assembled. Uh, there's a team of constitutional uh, experts in Toronto and civil liberties experts who have uh, already assembled and uh, the people are getting, uh, getting the legal defense that they need. And thanks very much to, uh, to Suzanne and the Mi'kmaq people. They are our first and last line of defense on the East Coast. Hi, hi. Thank you, Brian, and uh, Brian has already said a few things about Suzanne, but I am going to read uh, what we've got here to give people a, a little fuller picture. Uh, Suzanne is, is with the Mi'kmaq Warrior Society, and for, she is with the Eskasoni Reserve on Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia, whose heart... <laughs> ah, that's good. Whose heart and spirit belongs to the whole Mi'kmaq people of Mi'kmaq territory, the territory which comprises much of present-day maritime provinces. From the earliest days of the Mi'kmaq-led resistance to the early steps towards fracking on traditional Mi'kmaq territory to the violent raid by the RCMP on a peaceful camp of defenders of that land on October 17th, Suzanne has consistently been the epitome of a warrior, courageous, defiant, and compassionate. Suzanne is a knowledgeable person in traditional medicines, spirituality, and treating law, treaty law, and she is much, much more than that. We look forward to hearing from you, Suzanne. Suzanne. <laughs> Majestali e mi magi, a biggis in dead giskuk, bejit loogi. Hi, my name is Suzanne Patlis. I come from Mi'kmaq territory, and I acknowledge my existence here on Treaty Seven territory. Not really um, used to acknowledging a number and a treaty because um, we're not used to that in my territory. And when I came from, I just came from a tour in British Columbia, and I had to acknowledge each nation when I was in their territory. So it's kind of a, it's kind of like a cultural shock to me being here where I'm just acknowledging a, a, a number treaty. Um, just to get an idea on why it's different for our treaties in our territory and then the treaties here, all of our treaties are pre-Confederation and uh, they happened prior to Canada forming their Confederacy. So in saying that, um, our struggles out east uh, began many, many years ago, uh, maybe four, four and a half years ago, f maybe five, when we were disputing a company called Petroworth Resources. They were an Alberta-based company who were trying to come into our territory to um, hydraulic fracture the land. Um, and uh, it all stemmed from hearing it from my father. He came up to me and he said, all of this fighting you guys are doing, he said, why aren't you guys doing anything about this? So I wondered what, what exactly, what, is he, what was he talking about? What was fracking? Um, what was this process and what did it entail? So being a researcher, I decided to find out everything I wanted to know, everything that had to do with this project. Um, from the, the way the corporate structure is to the way they do the development to the way they poison the water, like the whole structure of it all, just to have a full understanding. 
And then when I found out how much water it destroys and how much water it poisons, I then wanted to find out more traditionally on how important our water was. I understood that it was sacred, but I ha had to understand it on a deeper level. So um, with all of that, I decided to, you know, we needed to get educated more. So, but we sat down and we came to a consensus that we were gonna dispute this. Um, in our territory, our Indian Act elected representatives were approached in 1997 by oil company presidents to pursue um, issues on Aboriginal title, Aboriginal rights and treaty rights. So um, they're trying to sign on to a comprehensive land claim agreement, which is unconstitutional and illegal. Um, but as lawyers will say, at the end of the day, everything will be fine. Um, it's not fine right now, so you can't uh, justify your illegalness by you know having it okay at the end of the day. And with saying that, uh, we decided, despite uh, these uh, so-called Indian Act elected representatives who want to call themselves our leaders, to sign on to these agreements, we weren't going to put up with it. So we decided to band together and start a campaign against hydraulic fracturing. We successfully got the company to come into our community to come have a so-called information session where we knew they would try to deem it as consultation. So we had documentation prepared and we did our research. And when the time came for the meeting to come in, we um, confronted the oil company and we didn't let them speak. They had a nice, pretty presentation already set to go where they were gonna do what they wanted. But um, as history repeats itself, um, if you look at the Jesuit relations, they'll say the, the savages from Cape Breton are the worst. So uh, we didn't put up with their, um, we didn't put up with them. We weren't gonna let them uh, come in and do anything in our territory. So um, we, we had a battle with this company where we were uniting with uh, non-indigenous people and we were uniting with all creeds and cultures. And it wasn't, um, this was a title fight, as you know, they would say in boxing, but a legal, it was a legal title fight. None of this exploration was supposed to happen in a so-called reservation. We don't uh, like to be defined by colonial borders and we refuse it. So, and we know that the Indian Act elected representatives only have justification within the borders of the reservation. So we already knew right off the hop they had no voice. And uh, we fought hard with this company and we made them broke. They didn't come into our territory and um, they're non-existent now where they had to change their name. And that also is a strategic approach. When a company goes broke, they're, they're subsidized and then the name changes and then the company presidents change. So they're always gonna get paid for that company that went bankrupt. It's a corporate scheme. And uh, with, with our success with that, uh, when things were getting hot and heavy in Elsie Buktuk, uh, we were asked to come out there to help them with their their strategic approaches to fighting this. So I went out there in early June. I was arrested June 9th. And before that, there was already about three people who were arrested. One of them was a 16-year-old boy who uh, told the RCMP to not touch his mother. And they arrested him, held him in a police car for several hours. Uh, they arrested another woman where they broke her arm. Um, I was arrested June 9th, so that was about June 14th, there was about 11 people arrested. It was mixed, where there were some non-Indigenous people arrested at that time, but a majority of the people were, um, were Indigenous. And uh, the interesting thing about all of this is uh, when I received my full disclosure, it included all of the pictures of the people who were arrested on June 14th as if I had something to do with it. I was like, well, I wasn't even there. I was sleeping. <laughs> but. Um, so with, with that, um, I first, when I first got arrested, I went to court and I had legal aid representing me and I was disgusted. I was like, these are, these are lawyers, they, got, they just sound like they're fresh out of high school. It was, um, I was really concerned about how they received their um, degree, I, I was stunned. And uh, so I decided, you know what, next time I'm gonna represent myself. I had lawyers contacting me, telling me I was crazy, telling me don't do it, telling me that, because I, I was adamant that I'm sovereign and that the government and that the RCMP have no authority over me. I don't care how much they scream and cry, they have no authority over me. So, um, so from there I decided I was gonna fight it in court and I was gonna uh, bring justice for my people and people were saying, do you know the ramifications of this? There's so many different uh, things that could come down and it could be a big problem for a lot of people. 
I said there's no other way because when you think about how court plays out, where you have these lawyers giving each other each other's evidence, they read through it and then they do a play. And where it was already all played out, they're reading from a script where they already know each other's strategy. I'm going in there with a blank piece of paper where I don't have to show them anything. I don't have to tell them anything. I don't have to make them prepare. They went to school for eons and eons and they're representing people all the time and they're trying to put people in jail all the time so they have enough preparation. But every time I stepped into their courtroom, they weren't prepared or they had to get a special prosecutor to come in. And, and when I was just one Indian woman standing there with a, with a room full of Indians backing me up. Um, so, uh, from there, uh, on June 21st is when we seen the violence from the RCMP increase, where that's when you see pictures of elders being punched, uh, elders being put in headlock, where eight and a half month old pregnant woman was, uh, she was arrested as well, and when she was in the cell, well, she didn't get to the cell yet, but a woman was gonna take her to the cell, a woman RCMP officer, and told her, get prepared, because you're gonna have your baby in here. And this was her first offense ever, and it's just a scare tactic. They were playing psychological warfare on our people. And, then, and the interesting thing about that day, June 21st is National Aboriginal Day. And on that day, we had non-Aboriginal people stepping up to the plate. They were doing their acts of civil disobedience, yet they were picked up and pushed to the side of the road and told to stay at a safe distance. Uh, so it, go to, it went to show how um, systematically racist the RCMP were being at that time. So uh, at, from there, in July, things were getting hot and heavy because the fight was out in our traditional hunting grounds and um, it was an everyday battle. And finally, a truck was taken over for about approximately eight hours. Um, the men came in from the society because they were sick and tired of seeing all of this stuff happening and that um, more action was required. So a truck was taken over for about eight hours. Uh, charges were not laid for that day until September 11th is when we were stormed in the streets of Moncton because we were going to go after the AFN chiefs for, you know, being sellouts. So we were pretty uh, upset with them and when we got there, the RCMP rushed us as if it was a drug raid charged, told me first, we have your truck, and it's busted, and I was, I was pissed off. I was like, what are you guys doing with my truck? You have a warrant, and they're like, it's busted, and I was blaming them, and then they said, well, we got a charge for you. I told, and I was like, man, and I was arguing with the cop, and he's like, you're smarter than me, and you're not gonna do this to me. He said, I'm not gonna get you out here. I'm gonna get you at another time, because there's always trouble when we deal with you. And I was looked at him and I kind of laughed at him. But then when we went into court, about 20, 30 officers, came, no, I think they counted 19 officers plus their uh, sheriffs for the courthouse came up to me to, to get me charged. And I was getting into it with their officers because I had members of the Warrior Society there with me. And then I finally told the cop, why don't you just shoot me and get your job over and done with, make it easier. You're always bothering me, you're always trying to charge me. I said, I'm sovereign and I don't have to sign your piece of paper, but if it'll make you happy, I'll sign it, but let it be on the record. Anything I say it can and will be used against me or for me and you're forcing me. So I signed it and I said, on the record, I'm being forced. And so I walked into the courtroom. He didn't take me in at that time, but they ended up dropping those charges as well. And uh, with my first charges, I went for a five-month battle with them before they dropped them. I didn't plea at all, because I don't have to. Um, and with my October charges, uh, the company decided at the end of July to take a break after we held their trucks hostage and held them hostage, so-called hostage. Um, they call it mischief. Um, we had confrontation with the RCMP as a society and the RCMP because they, they, they raided that camp. It was a Skidoo camp, which was a public camp, where they took the women's drums, eagle feathers, flags. So th things were getting really intense. And for about a week, we were living up in the woods. And even Irvin left the woods. And they, they, they what do they call that? They do a lot of forestry and they tear down and they deplete our hunting areas and our forests. So even they were gone from the forest at that time. So it was really awesome to have no development happening in our hunting territory. 
And then as we progressed, the company came back towards the end of September. And uh, it was about September 28th when the RCMP set up their blockade on the road where they decided too many people were gathering up near this compound. So they decided to block the road. And then from there, more people decided to gather. And uh, SWM Resources got upset because their equipment wasn't leaving the compound. And when they had their uh, court proceedings, they were saying, it looks like a Tim Hortons over there. They have a trailer and everything. Like It's a campground there. They're really mad. And I was like, you know you really got them good when a corporate interest is mad at a bunch of poor Indians and poor, poor supporters all sitting around having a good time and trying to create consensus and working together to fight a corporate interest and to fight corporate colonialism. So from there, um, we were all working together to, to bridge all of these uh, gaps that have been created by colonialism, by the divisions that have been created within our own communities. As Brian said, um, New Brunswick is a gigantic reservation because of Irvin Incorporated. Also with, um, with all of this stuff happening, we were doing a lot of research and we delegitimized the provincial government we had paperwork that proved that Canada was a corporation and that they stole our lands. And it was their own documents, you know. They, they did good documentation of how they were stealing. I think they were bragging or something. It's gonna, <laughs> but um, we were showing them and we told them we expect a response. Uh, our response was waking up to 100 guns pointed directly at us. Um, we came out of the bush and then there the cops were on October 17th. Um, I don't really have much to say about that day. I know a lot of people want to hear it, but my spouse is still in jail, and so is my brother. Uh, they don't have court until mid-March and end of March, so I don't want to say anything that'll uh, infringe upon their rights while they're in there, because they're not having an easy time. Their rights are being violated on a constant, where they're not allowed to get any spiritual elders come in to help them. They're not allowed to pray in their spiritual manner. They were thrown into solitary confinement the first three weeks that they were put out there. Because after the October 17th raid, after we were beaten, um, they were denied bail on the 18th. But on the 19th, we decided to take over the highway. And my spouse called me from jail and he's like, what's going on? And I told him, we just took over the highway. They need to know that the guys they have in there are the wrong ones because we are the troublemakers out here. <laughs> and uh, he hung up on the phone and they end up throwing them in solitary confinement for three weeks. I apologized to them all the time, saying, I'm sorry, guys. He said, I know they're listening to the phone calls, but I didn't think the repercussions would be that bad for them. But... Um, in saying that, let's go back to October 17th when uh, the raid happened. All of the images you see all over the media, all over Facebook, all over YouTube, those are all images of the community members coming in to assist us because we were the only ones staying at the camp. And we being the members of the Mi'kmaq Warrior Society, people were, um, and there were people there too, but it wasn't uh, very many people at that time. Um, usually there was more, but at this time, it's because there was so much going on, like in and out of everywhere, so there was hardly anybody on the inside, considering how many were on the outside, and to think that everything that happened on the outside was happening on the inside, it, there were two totally different circumstances. We had real assault rifles pointed at us, we had fake assault rifles pointed at us, um, we didn't get pepper sprayed though, so that's one thing that didn't happen, but we were shot at, we were beaten with assault rifles in their assault boots uh, when they came in, and it was about 40 officers who attacked me initially, um, and about uh, 20 to 30 officers per person. So it was a really um, heavy armed force that they had going on, and when they had tackled somebody, they were tackling them with their guns pointed at their heads. I had about six. But my last thought, it's funny though, my last thought when I had the gun pointed at my head was, shit, I wanted a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And that's all I could think about the whole time I was in jail. Oh, man, I want a cigarette. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was very interesting that I eventually got it. But I've been actively working to try to get our men on the inside. Um, 
justice. Even their fundamental rights that they have, they're being denied that because they make the stance to stand up for the land. Um, my spouse has about 19 charges from that day, and my brother has about 16. So uh, they're heavy charges, and we don't know um, the circumstances of how it's going to happen because initially they were supposed to have a bail hearing in October, but one of the men's bail hearings lasted two and a half days. Bail hearings usually last two and a half hours. Um, so they decided to speedy up the process. They're going to waive their bail hearing and they'll get a trial. Their trial date was supposed to be in the middle of December. But the Crown then decided to throw more charges on them, so then they won't have court until end of March. Um, they were supposed to have a preliminary trial at the end of January, but apparently the Crown again wasn't prepared. So um, there's a lot of um, unprofessional lawyers in an unprofessional system back east and it's very difficult to deal with it especially when um, I've become so knowledgeable about their system and I know how manipulative they're being and it, it frustrates me to see what they're continuously doing to my people and to all people and the conditions that they throw upon people. Uh, my brother who was on the tour with me who just headed out back east to be with his family, he has a condition on him that he's not allowed 40 meters 400 meters near any shale gas protest. What, what happened to his fundamental right, his charter right to be able to have the freedom to assembly? So that went out the window. Um, so th there's no more such things as rights. What we have to start understanding is our responsibilities. And when we start to stand up for our responsibilities, then we don't need a right to do it. And uh, my message out uh, in British Columbia was to, uh, that I came out there to spread the, the embers of resistance that I had in my heart out there to see if it'll, if it'll spark out there, if it'll set up fire, just like the RCMP cars, just like the tires, you know, like God bless whoever set that all on fire because it, it created good media. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it created a good thing it, for visually, you know, some people might be, oh, no, they, they, I can't believe they did that. But it's an uncompromising stance that sometimes our people have to take. And when we went out there, we're telling them, because everybody always asks easy questions when you go to an event. How can we do to support? Well, ask yourself, what are you good at? Um, what can you do? How are you going to create a culture of resistance? Because without creating that culture, how are we ever going to rise above what we're currently indoctrined into, which is corporate colonialism? So if we're going to create a revolution, we must create that culture of resistance, whether it be through art, music, um, events such as these uh, gatherings, uh, letter writing, phone calls, um, you know, organizing, whatever it is by your means. Not everybody has to stand up, put their lives on the line and be a warrior, have a gun pointed at your head. It's not everybody's role and responsibility. But if it is, then do it. Um, it's just our problem is uh, we, we suffer from the symptoms of oppression, which is fear. And as soon as we throw that fear away, then we no longer can be oppressed. So thank you. If applause means anything, well, we have some time. We have a good amount of time now for uh, any questions that people have to uh, any person on the panel. And uh, as usual in these kinds of things, uh, we'd really, we really do want to hear from the folks who are here. And if you have a, a question, please ask a question and not a whole lot of speeches from the floor uh, and try to make it as succinct as possible, and I'll I'll try to sort of keep track of, of orders of people. Pardon? Are you turning on a floor mic? Or it, that's I don't think we got a floor mic, do we? Oh, hmm? don't need one. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we'll we'll start. That's first. You're second, and you're third. Uh, the tents and, and the damage to the lawn. Uh, 
above that threshold is uh, a term, a conceptual concept, uh, uh, abstract that they call violence, and below that is is peaceful. Um, so I want to ask you, what relation ontologically do these concepts concepts have to uh, the First Nations of Mi'kmaq's understanding of, of harmony and existence with nature? That was a complex question, but um, <laughs> um, as a Mi'kmaq person, uh, you t we tend to want to frame indigenous people as these peace, loving, caring, holding hands and singing kumbaya people. And where uh, it's not, where our warrior culture is not recognized, where we're not seen as, you know, it's because the colonialists, when they came in, they were calling us heathens and savages. It's trying to erase that image for a long time and um, to turn the warrior into that heathen and savage when in fact it's not. And you want to say that it's violent when it's... Uh, in, when you look at all of our indigenous languages, each one of us has that concept of warriorism. In my language, it's called being a smogonist. And uh, with this whole... Um, range of be between violence and all of this. Uh, cop cars burning, that happened before the Warrior Society was even arrested. Um, that was 1.30 in the afternoon, one o'clock in the afternoon. All of our members were arrested prior to 10 a.m. Also, if that was violent, then who was hurt? Nobody. Um, our people were hurt on that day. Our people had guns pointed at them. Our people were pepper sprayed while they were praying. Our people were physically assaulted, our people were traumatized by the whole events that happened that day. So I think um, because you hit back at a time when you're being uh, hit, like to say all of the things that happen on the outside perimeter, if a cop went and punched an indigenous person, hypothetically speaking, and the indigenous person went and punched them back, um, to me that's self-defense. I don't care if you're wearing a badge or if you're wearing a a uni whatever kind of uniform, then the repercussions of your actions, you're going to face those repercussions. Because I come from a family of resistance, where my mom refused to get go to Indian Day School, and her father refused to allow her to go to residential school, because he told the Indian agent, I'll shoot you if you come and take my child. So um, there's levels to how much you're going to accept. You know, it's um, it depends on how indoctrined you are into that culture. Bill, can I just add to that? Uh, it's, it seems extremely critical to uh, point out, uh, to reinforce rather what uh, Suzanne said, because it's critical to know that the mainstream media focused on those burning vehicles. And as Suzanne quite correctly said, the warriors were arrested before that event. And I saw video footage that friends shot who are back there showing the Mi'kmaq peoples, their allies, in confrontation with the line of police officers, some of whom were, as Suzanne pointed out, were heavily armed. And they were, what, 100, 200 meters away from the cars? The media has focused on that. Nobody's been charged yet. Nobody has been charged in connection with that. Uh, what, six, six months, eight months after? We need to ask the critical question, why? There have been incidents before, there have been periods in this history where the forces of law and order have used illegal means planted to evidence in order to justify a heavier police response. All I'm asking, if people take nothing else away from, from this gathering tonight, is to please be critical and ask these questions. Why has nobody been charged? Whose interests were served in having this demonstration of, uh, of, of violence. And by the way, those cars, those burned out cars, were left to sit there for a week after this incident. It was the chief of the Elsa Patug Reserve who got together with some men to haul these cars away so that the children didn't see them on their way to school every day. They were left there deliberately. Uh, sure. I 
I, I just want to say if anyone doesn't recognize Twyla, she's actually the, the lady that was asked to leave uh, during the Prime Minister's visit on Friday. Uh, we were, we were, uh, <laughs> we, we had a plan that day. <laughs> We had a plan that day, and uh, we didn't know how the day was going to pl play out. We uh, had gone in together, and I and my husband are very well-known uh, members within the Idle No More mo uh, movement on the Blood Tribe, and uh, we just we, we didn't understand why Twyla was targeted. I will say, uh, from my pers perspective as a witness and as somebody that actually recorded what happened, uh, she was doing absolutely nothing wrong. She didn't even have her phone. Uh, she was in front of us the whole time. She was talking to another lady over here on this side. She came over, she said a few words to us. The, so the 15, 10 to 15 minutes up to, leading up to the cops approaching her, she didn't even have her phone. She had her daughter on her lap. You know, it was completely oh. unexpected. Uh, a lot of people have been saying, so why didn't, you know, why didn't anyone act? Why didn't anyone stop this? Well, to begin with, our members were being stopped at the entrance. Uh, we... One of my friends here who was actually trying to come in, and uh, she said that they're telling, telling them at the door that the, uh, the event was full. So I took a picture of the blank bench in front of me and I said, I posted that to Facebook. So those of us that were sitting there were on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're texting, we're taking pictures, we were on our phones. There were no signs saying that you could not use your phones. There were no signs telling us there were no announcements made. Anything that we could not do, there were never any anybody saying you can't do this. So when they approached her, we were just completely dumbfounded as to why they approached her and her uh, five or six year old daughter. And, and then they proceeded to do the same thing to her older daughter. Uh, when all of this was happening, right off the bat, we were told that the we have these, uh, like I talked about the Sundance here, and within the Sundance we have these societies. And once I heard that the Brave Dog Society was in there, I don't have uh, a lot of experience within the Sundance itself. I've never been a part of a society. So I only knew my, my uh, as a community member, as a Blood Tribe member, that these are members that command a certain amount of respect. Uh, and you're not to raise your voice to them. You're not to... Uh, a pro, you know, uh, be emotional in front of them. You're not to touch them. You're not to be angry near them. And so it changed the entire situation. It wasn't just the police we were dealing with. Uh, and also as it, within our culture, our elders are held to a higher esteem. And anyone that's older than us, you know, has the right to say, well, you're younger, you're, you know, this is your place. And so this was the way the whole situation played out. We just, I, I can honestly say I didn't know what to do in that situation. When I heard that the society was involved, I didn't know how to deal with that. How, if it was just the police, I'd have been right in there. I would have been right up there. I would have been, and I had voiced a few concerns uh, in the video, but in the end, I didn't know how to handle that situation when once the society was mentioned that they were handling the situation. Um, and so now we've, uh, what we've been experiencing since that day, uh, we, we went ahead with our plan uh, after they were asked to leave and we held up our Stop Harper signs in front of the, uh, the Prime Minister when he came in. And, <laughs> and, we, and we were also escorted out by the police and uh, they were, uh, all I can say is that the police that day were very, very handsy. They were touching basically all of us, even though we were telling them not to. Um, and we were basically let out of the event uh, after, you know, the, we did our, our little protest there. And we went out and uh, I immediately went to Twyla and I told her, whatever you're going to do, we, you know, we're behind you. You didn't do anything wrong. Your daughter didn't do anything wrong. And I, and I don't even care if you were tweeting negative things, that's your right. That's your, I mean, that's, you know, you, we all have the, you know, they talk about freedom and speech. Uh, Shannon Hull mentioned something today about, you know, somebody said this is a free country. Well, 
you know, I, I stand by everything that we did and I stand by everyone having the right to express their opinion and I don't, I, I just, I, I said it before and I'll say it again, that, that little bluebird's a dangerous fellow. <laughs> I just, <clears throat> just, thank you, Laurie. I just want to add to that by saying thank you so much, Laurie, and to uh, other Indigenous peoples in the room who were down in blood on Friday, took photographs and shot video. It's really important to say this. I set up when I was back east at Elsa Patok to the people there. I did a civil liberties seminar back there for the resistors. We are all recorders and reporters these days with digital cameras or who doesn't have a cell phone that has a camera on it. It is our right to record. The police may ask you to turn over your equipment. Do not. It is not against the law to record the police as they go about their conduct. They are not above the law. They are citizens of this land. We are citizens, citizens of this land. It is how we hold them accountable. So thanks very much for recording and reporting. The other thing I want to say about uh, what took place uh, on Blood on Friday was people like Lori, that's her territory. She had a right to be there. She has a right to peacefully assemble. And all these reports that I've been hearing about uh, security officers, whether it's uh, the Red Dog Society, tribal police, or any security in who, private security there, or the RCP themselves, all this touching constituted assaults. So to go back to your question there about lateral violence and how it's dealt with, uh, you deal with it head on. Uh, you don't put up with it at all. You call them out, whether it be creating propaganda against them, writing on their Facebook walls, or writing on your own wall and saying, you know what, this is what this person said, or this is what this person did. Because um, you can't condone violence no matter what it is, but you can't also focus on it too much because lateral violence was created so that we'll forget about the oppressor. So we could either call it out or call it out once and forget it, leave it. And then you leave it so, and you put it away where it ain't gonna hurt anybody anymore. And then you move forward and you, or you use that that aggression that it caused you to, to fight the oppressor even further. Um, I faced many uh, different kinds of lateral violence in my lifetime. Um, a lot of times where you think that you can't do anything about it, but you can. And you could, uh, you could stop it right in its tracks, but you just can't put up with it. You just gotta remain adamant and strong that you're not gonna put up with anybody's shit. Um, heard nothing since October 17th. Um, what's happened since? Um, like I said, October 19th, the highway was blocked. Then the company decided to not come back until it was already snowing, which they were led with uh, civil disobedience on the ground, and then tires started burning for three consecutive days. Then the company left. Said they weren't going to come back till 2015. The premier cried and cried to get them back. So they're planning on coming back um, early spring of this year, but uh, they don't know the resistance that they're going to face and the the different court actions that could happen, even though I have no faith in the court system. But there are going to be some things that happen in there. It's, it's all messed up, it's corrupt. So what we need to do is to emancipate our nations and to work towards our sovereignty in order to defeat the system because we gotta tear it apart, it's no good. Okay, let's see, at the back and then Cindy Provost. 
he stepped out. If you're going to come here and talk in Treaty 7 territory, talk about love. You don't need more violence in Calgary. We had a 14th Street Bridge standoff. I had to go home with it. I walked out then. I told those people, get some love in your hearts. If you can leave us with some hope, that would be great. Um, sorry for uh, leaving you a bit hopeless, but that's what our men are feeling inside of the prison walls right now. And if it feels, if you feel as though I'm not um, showing any love, it's because through all of this oppression that I've been facing, I, I'm emotionless. I don't cry and I don't uh, show emotion. That day I was getting beaten. I didn't. I didn't cry. I'm not going. I'm not an angry person. I'm saying, yeah, all of this violence happened, but that's what happened in my territory. I'm only here to share a story. I'm not here to give any answers or solutions. Yes, I said we need to strive for our sovereignty, but it doesn't mean it can't be do done in a loving manner. And if I offended you, I'm sorry. And if uh, it means that I'm no longer welcome in Treaty Seven, then that's fine. And uh, I just want to say, as uh, somebody who was from the Maritimes originally. I felt love when I got, went back there. I felt love, acceptance at the uh, at their sacred fire camp. I felt nothing but love and acceptance from the Mi'kmaq people and their allies back there. One thing I've always uh, hated is bullying. And uh, when I see oppressive tactics being displayed against a peaceful people who are simply standing for all of our rights, then we also have to take a stand. I saw, yes, there were individual officers back there, and Suzanne can vouch for this herself, who had tears in their eyes during confrontations with the Mi'kmaq peoples and their supporters. Uh, we do have Cindy Provo here with us, and my understanding is she was going to speak for a couple minutes. Uh, props to the Calgary Police Services and for the proactive stance in terms of multicultural diversity and uh, building bridges uh, with the uh, First Nations uh, peoples. And I've been at rallies where the CPS has been there, and I'm glad to see them because they're there for our protection. Maybe Cindy Provo and the Calgary Police Service uh, could be enlisted to uh, talk to the RCMP because they really need to be learning a lesson about respect for Native peoples and respect for the cultural protocols. I will say that uh, for us on the, the Blood Tribe, uh, there were, we've always worked with the police. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I've, I've looked back on Friday and I think, why weren't we targeted uh, the way that Twyla was in that manner? And uh, the only thing I could think of is that when Twyla was, uh, and, and the majority of our group were in Ottawa on December 21st, we actually had our first, uh, it wasn't a blockade, but it was a peaceful awareness campaign where we were diverting traffic uh, near uh, the, uh, the Blood Tribe community uh, of Moses Lake and Cardston. We were set up in that area and we had full support from our Blood Tribe police. They told us off the record that they supported us. They, they knew what this government was doing and that they stood behind us. So when we did, uh, we had worked with the, the sergeant and uh, we never had any problems with the police. And when we talked to the, um, whenever we have an event, they always, the police always contact us if it hits the media first and they tell us, let us know if you need our assistance, we will be there to help you. We've always had that relationship with them. And, uh, and the sergeant was present during the events on Friday. And I'm kind of thinking that, well, she already knows our reputation, but again, I don't know what, I don't know when, when it comes to the video, the one lady turns around and she says, well, so-and-so said, and then she didn't say who said. So I don't know where that, di that uh, directive came from to have Twyla removed, but we were not asked to leave. And uh, I had invited guests there that went to that day that were non-native. And that was another reason why I couldn't just get up and leave because I had, I asked them to be there with me. <laughs> and I didn't know, we just, it was, everything was so unexpected. Everything happened so fast. Everything was just a big confusion. And we had already been experiencing a division because of our group was, we were divided that day, not by choice, but because half of our group were, were barred from entering. And there were only a few of us members that were actually inside. When you see the video of us walking out, the benches are nearly empty because there were no community members at that point. Whoever was in the other room with the yellow dots were uh, basically at the tables and they were eating. 
So we were uh, kind of separate because we were the community members. So um, that's again, you know, I don't know again uh, why that happened that day, but we were with Twyla. <laughs> Twyla has a question, so go ahead. Okay, I think there was a question with the orange shirt on here, and then at the back, and uh, Cindy, if, uh, are you back there? Yeah, if at point, if you, uh, it might be good for you to speak to, uh, but we'll hear from this gentleman, and then at the back, and then you. Is that okay? Okay, thanks. Go ahead. Um, Chantel, once again, and uh, she's another sister of mine, traditional sister, traditional mom. Uh, thank you for the elder as well for your prayers and to uh, welcome us in a good way. I uh, intentionally brought my my sergeant Bill Dodd. I want him to actually uh, speak first if if we can, and uh, I'll share my spirit and my heart with you in a few minutes. Um, thanks, and I came up because Cindy told me to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I think that uh, you know a lot of the the issues that are being brought forward and things, and, and I certainly wouldn't put ourselves up on some sort of pedestal that we are um, the perfect organization that can be <clears throat> telling other organizations how to respond or how to, uh, what had happened or how things go, um, because a lot of these dynamics um, are fluid. Um, you know, we weren't there to, to see what happened, you guys obviously were, so, um, you know, I'm certainly not going to speak to anything that I don't know anything about. Um, what I would say that in our position here, in, in Cindy's position and my position, is that <clears throat> what we're not going to promise that we are perfect or that, um, uh, that everything is always going to go right because it's not. There's always going to be issues but our job is communication and to keep lines of communication open so why we come tonight is to 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 listen to hopefully learn um to um get other perspectives that we wouldn't otherwise get and uh and to always let people know that there is um a willingness certainly on our part um to to learn and to understand. Um, one of the things that, that we are, are constantly doing within, I know within our service, is we try to understand that all these things are complex and dynamic, but the more you know, the more you understand, uh, the more you can communicate and to hear other people's perspectives, that can never be a bad thing. You're not always going to agree. Um, there are competing interests. Um, as we know, within within the uh, um, uh, living in Alberta and the oil industry and all these kind of things, there are a number of competing interests. Um, when we, it comes down to to what we want want to see, is we want to respect um, you know people's rights and their responsibilities um, in a peaceful manner because that's what we have created here. Um, luckily, in Calgary so far. Um, is that we are not, we do not want to be adversaries, we want to be partners. Um, we want to make sure that, um, like I said, not everything is going to go right. Not every, we're not always going to agree. Um, but if we can keep those lines of communication open, then uh, things that spill into uh, violence or where people are getting hurt or people are being mistreated, which um, there has been, like I said, I'm not going to speak to that because I wasn't there, 
Um, but there, I agree there has been a long history of that. Um, and there is a lot of um, a misunderstanding and mistrust, and that's what leads to those kind of things. So if we can mitigate that by staying open, open-minded, and open communication, that's what our role is, and that's what we are here for tonight, is to, um, to share those kind of things. We're very fortunate to have Cindy, um, because Cindy is able to bring, again, another perspective that um, the people that are making decisions for our organization sometimes don't get. So. Thank you, Bill. Boss. I'm real bossy with him. Uh, in front of my elder, I just introduced my name, and I'm bringing in a whole other level of integrity. And my Indian name is uh, Sun Woman, and it was uh, transferred to me in 2012 in December. And thank you for my sister. We, we work so hard. Uh, with each other, um, what I bring, and I'm, I'm privileged and honored to do this, is I stepped into the role as Aboriginal liaison, and there's been 34 years of relationship that has been built. So I'm standing on the shoulders of our elders and their vision to work together in a good way. I'm standing on the shoulders of the other liaison officers that came before me to start this relationship because it comes down to relationship. And I get the privilege to work 365 days a year in partnership with a lot of the people that you see here. That's why we keep getting asked to come and, and I thank you from my heart because you're not gonna change people 2,000 at a time. You're gonna change people, one, two people at a time. And uh, I think our strategy <laughs> has kind of rubbed off because I get invited, so thank you. Um, and and the, the morals, ethics, and integrity that I bring as a Blackfoot woman from Pikani myself is my great-grandfather served in World War I. My, two of my great uncles also served in World War I. The one that died overseas, he was 16 years old, he lied about his age, and he died. So when I put on my uniform, these are the ones that I carry. When I carry my childhood name with me as well, and that um, hardly carries a shadow. And that was the name that I was given when I was 16. And the meaning behind that name was that I would help other people see their spirits and to recognize that their spirit is something from Creator. And then I got the new name. So now it's like I'm an elder to my first name. So when I come out or when we do training or uh, provide education and awareness for the decision makers, our chief and exec. I'm pretty bossy with them too, I'll let you know. <laughs> so when I provide that kind of uh, leadership and say, no, we need to pay attention to this. I'm gonna take you back to, to uh, the 14th Street Bridge occupation. And there we are, again myself, my Sergeant Bill Dodd, and we're dressed like this. We're not dressed in any other way because I'm just gonna shame the 34 years that brought me to this day. And what I do and what I say, the actions that I, that I take is all reflecting. And who am I to think that I'm more important than that 34 years? So, that's the spirit and intent that was present on the 14th Street Bridge. There were promises made in my name as Aboriginal liaison to the occupiers of that 14th Street Bridge. And I'll fast forward to the resolution. There were no charges because we promised as a police service there will be no charges. So there was no charges. There was promises made again in my name because the occupier wanted face-to-face -face time with the mayor. 
we got her the face-to-face -face time with the mayor. And we were present with every other, we don't even call them protests because that's not what they are. We're, we're under strict um, direction that any of the gatherings, because that's what they are, you know why? Because they're all peaceful. You know why? Because these fine ladies in the front row bring their spirit and intent of the woman spirit and their drums are always present. That's one of the biggest reasons why we've been able to manage what I, what I do. It's very simple. You know why? Because those drums are there and these women are there. So that was what happened on, Feb on uh, the, occup uh, the occupation of the 14th Street Bridge. I'll bring you up to today. Um, I'm the longest serving, uh, I guess as Aboriginal portfolio, the longest serving in building relations with the uh, diverse community in the city of Calgary. But even, um, even though I'm the longest one, I'm the last one to build what we call the Chief's Advisory Board. And I only did that this year. I, I wish I had a double because then the work would be divided. But there's only me, and thank you boss for being patient with me. Um, there's two occupiers that were present on the 14th Street Bridge that are now serving on my Aboriginal advisory board with my chief. I want to let you know that. One of them is 22 years old. That's totally awesome. And he works in the language in Sutina. So, and the other is, a, is uh, one of the sisters that's always present as well. Autumn Eagle Speaker is the other uh, one that we have. And these board are going to have the ear of our chief. So um, that's what relationship means. That's what I carry in my heart, and that's what I try to uh, bring to any gathering, any learning, any opportunity that I can uh, work with our young people, work with our at-risk women, um, partner, and, and all those. I just get the privilege of doing this 365 days a year, whereas sometimes uh, it's event or it's, um, it's um, protest specific when you see, you know, other police or, or, or whatever. Um, that's not my role. My role is to be in partnership and um, to build that confidence and trust 365 days a year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy and Bill, too. Now, we still have time for a couple of questions, I think. So, yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. We still got some time. So, are there any more questions? Yep, right there. Okay. I know of uh, I know of uh, only a single country on the planet where we indeed have seen that uh, respect for Mother Earth enshrined in the Constitution, and that is uh, Bolivia. Uh, Bolivia has. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm fairly certain that Bolivia has the largest uh, population, uh, proportionally speaking, of indigenous peoples on the planet. 53% of the people of Bolivia are uh, indigenous peoples, and the president of Bolivia, uh, S. Morales, um, 
is indigenous and uh, they've enshrined uh, respect for the environment and respect for the planet into their constitution. So props to the people of Bolivia. Um, and about you talking about the voice of the animals and the voice of Mother Earth, um, how do we know what they're saying when we're not listening? Uh, you know, I'm sorry to say that, but that's what an elder, we went to a ceremony while I was in BC, and he said, are you really listening to the animals? Are you really listening to the earth? Are you really sending the message that they're trying to send? So who are we to say that we are their voice when we don't even know what their voice speaks? So um, the other problem I have with uh, trying to uh, give it a voice is that we don't, uh, we try to be above it. We try to put ourselves before it. Uh, what gives us that right? Um, when we're supposed to place it before ourselves. Water is sacred and it's held up high. If it's responsible for all life and um, for being that, that all-powerful entity that ties us and binds us with the past and the future and with every living creature and, or living entity in this, in this world, then who are we to put ourselves before it when we're supposed to put, put it above us? But I think that's what um, reverberated throughout the throughout Turtle Island, well, the northern part, so-called Canada, when uh, Bill C-45 came through and they removed the water protections and I heard her talk a lot about that. But what it created was, was a legislative vacuum. And what people don't um, tend to think about is how to create uh, that plug. We as Indigenous people have the right to be able to fill that void, but yet we're um, still sitting idly doing nothing to fill it. Um, if we were really to truly be idle no more, then we would be doing something to fill that legislative vacuum and to design a way to um, put water above us and to be able to f fulfill those protections. But right now, um, that's still something that's being left in theory land. Well, I, I, I've been saying that, and, and that's the thing, you know, growing up, uh, I. I never had to leave the reserve to uh, fish. I've, uh, I've fished every year of my life, and those are my two fishing partners right there, my mom and my grandma. Uh, every year we go fishing, and we've, you know, up until recently, we've never ever, I've never had a fishing license in my life. Um, I, I refuse to ever get one because, you know, why would I need one to fish in my own land, in my own territory? We eat the fish we catch. You know, so for me, when I when I was younger, I had this huge lake. Uh, I live in uh, on the reserve. It's called Bullhorn Area, and it's a coulee. And so this huge lake was beneath <clears throat> below our house. So we never ever had to go anywhere to go swimming, to go fishing, boating, whatever we want. All we had to do was go down the hill. We never had to pay anybody for that. Well, that is gone today, and so I am listening, and I I. I look at what is gone. There are no fish there anymore. We don't fish there anymore. We can't, they're gone. You know, the, the plants and animals, everything that was there once upon a time is now gone. And when I was growing up, I remember sitting there and I used to think, you know, I, I hear about these environmentalists, I hear about these, you know, non-natives that are, you know, they call them tree huggers and all of this, and I thought, when are they ever gonna come to the reserve? When are they ever gonna come and talk about what's happening here? Where did our water go? You know, our water ended up being, you know, going into the St. Mary's Reservoir, and, and you know, the Bullhorn Coulee has suffered a lot in that process, but I, I think I'm the only one I've ever heard talk about it. <laughs> Um, so I really, really, I I've talk about our culture. I talk about how every part of our culture comes from the earth. We don't, you know, I, a lot of times now we can go to the store, you know, go to certain gift shops and whatnot and, and buy supplies and, and this. But for us, you know, uh, something like mint, it's, 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 it's a very traditional plant that we, we pick every year. And I was saying this is a, in an area where it's always really marshy and really wet. And so I see the threat with the fracking and the chemicals. And, you know, um, we already have uh, the largest industry we have on our reserve is agriculture. So we have a lot of pesticides, things like that. So for me, I, I think these are directly tied into what we're doing, at, you know, talking about this because 
uh, the water is important to everything, not just to us, but it's important to everything. And everything is, uh, you know, with us, everything goes in a circle. Everything is connected. Everything goes, you know, whatever you put in, it's, it's going to come back. So uh, I think that we're all basically doing that just by, you know, talking about these issues. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and then uh, they're going to have to close up. But before they do that, uh, you'll have a chance to talk to individuals too uh, before everybody leaves. Well, now you see five hands go up when I say there's time for one more question. But I think at the at the at the back, no, well, middle, yeah. Travis, Travis, is that am I seeing correctly? Jeez, my eyes are still sort of okay. Okay. Yeah, that was a very uh, succinct question. <laughs> I am going to uh, uh, close it off now. I, I think actually, Tavis, what you've done, and uh, I wouldn't just address your, mar your remarks to Cindy or uh, any uh, people of authority. I think they're addressed to all of us. I, I think uh, we've had a very rich evening tonight. Uh, uh, as moderator, I've uh, kept my silence and just sort of moderated. There's many places where I've wanted to jump in. <laughs> How do we live together in the land with justice? And I've always said throughout my career that it's much uh, more important, I think, for all of us to understand the roles that each one of us plays and the communities we're part of and the responsibilities that each one of us has as members of the communities that we're part of. Uh, to understand who we are and how we're going to learn to live together. And especially for me, as uh, we, we live in these perilous times of climate justice, of racial justice, of gender justice, 
All these things are coming together in, in my mind. And we have to find forms and ways in which we can sit in a circle together and listen, and then listen again, and then listen again to each other's stories about how we are going to live together peacefully with one another, but just as important in peace with the earth, uh, with respect and listening to one another. Uh, this has been a very rich evening for me uh, to hear. Uh, I don't mind listening to you, Brian. It's good to listen to you. But particularly to listen to Suzanne and Lori and their stories that are extremely important where they live, but that are also a microcosm of what we all face in the earth around the world, as a matter of fact. So I want to thank you both particularly very much for putting your heart out there, for putting your mind out there, for putting your bodies on the line, and for being with us tonight. And thank everybody here who's been part of the conversation those who have listened, those who have asked questions, those who have spoken. Uh, this city, and I would say our land, needs a lot more evenings like this where we can be with one another and listen to one another. So thank you to everybody who's been part of this night. And so